Hello, my name is Jace Tanner. This is the first in a series on Vancouver's downtown east side. This week we hear from Libby Davies, former NDP MP and former Vancouver City Councillor. She discusses the history of the neighborhood and the Downtown East Side Residents Association. Thank you for being with us, Libby. The term Skid Road in, in BC comes from the fact that, and in fact, historically, that logs were skidded down the street. And the area that probably <clears throat> a lot of people have heard about, Gastown, which is, of course, now a tourist area, but the, these areas of uh, Gastown, Chinatown, uh, now the downtown east side, um, were all part of that early development of Vancouver's European settlement. And so the notion of Skid Road, it was an area um, where there were many uh, licensed alcohol premises, beer parlors as we would call them, or in some other cities they'd be called taverns. Um, they were beer parlors that had hotels and rooming houses attached to them. And they did a fine business uh, because what would happen is that the resource workers, the men who worked in the logging and the mining and the fishing, but primarily logging, they would go out to the camps in the interior and the coastal areas of BC. And then after, you know, two or three months of being in a camp working like dogs day and night, they'd hit the city, come into Vancouver, and they would stay in these old hotels. Well, at the time, they would have been relatively new. Now they're very old. And they would have stayed in these premises and they would, and they had no cooking facilities. They were single rooms. And so today, these buildings that still exist, these old hotels and rooming houses are referred to as SROs, a completely ignored and forgotten area. It was an area of Vancouver immediately adjacent to the downtown business district. So it's the oldest part of Vancouver. It's an area that people would drive through, they would go through on the bus and, you know, kind of close their eyes. You know, there might be, pe there'd be a lot of people on the street. And so it became, it became very much a stigmatized area. And the people who lived in the neighborhood became stigmatized as well. I became involved in the neighborhood in the very early 1970s. I was actually 19 years old. You know, there were missions, there were charities, there were churches who had to, quote, administer to the poor and save the sinners, you know, very much the Victorian model of charity and helping people who are seen as down and out. Bruce had ideas. We begin the origins of a residence association, which we'll also talk about. And, and so it was, it was really a transformational change where people who lived in the neighborhood began to assert their own voice and began to say, this is a community. You see us as down and outers. You see us as Skid Road, but this is a community. As part of that change, um, there was a, a conscious decision to call the area the downtown east side. Gastown was a part of this area. It had the same architecture, the same buildings, the same history of the hotels and the rooming houses. And it was sort of a sub area of the downtown east side, but it was always known distinctly as Gastown um, because it was, it, uh, there were developers who bought up lots of the buildings and wanted to turn it into a tourist attraction, which of course it has become. The Downtown Eastside Residents Association, as its name clearly states, was an association of local residents. Uh, no big deal, but it was a huge deal because in this neighborhood, People weren't considered as citizens. They were clients. Uh, you know, they were subservient to landlords, the welfare system, um, to 
anybody, right? And so the notion that people were residents, they were citizens, they had rights. I mean, in most neighborhoods in Vancouver, as in any other city in, in Canada, you'd see ratepayers associations, you'd see local residents associations, property owners associations. And so when DIRA began, in, it was incorporated in August of 1973. It was an incredibly radical thing. We had tons of opposition. Um, this, this formation of a residence association of local people asserting their rights and their voice collectively was seen as very threatening to the powers that be in the, in the community, like the churches and the missions, who saw people literally as sinners, you know, as people to be saved, as people to be um, um, administrated, uh, to have their welfare check taken over and administrated because of course they weren't responsible enough to take care of their own money. And all of this, you know, absolutely um, outrageous sort of Victorian model of, of quote, helping people. The reaction to the formation of DIRA, the reaction to Bruce Erickson as the pivotal figure was unbelievable. It was, um, it was hostile. It was, um, these people are militant, they're radical, they're up to no good, they're upsetting the boat. Of course we were, we were actually all of those things. It was about asserting people's rights and I remember the objectives of DIRA that were drawn up for the constitution, for the, for, for the society, were, were very much about um, asserting human rights, housing rights, um, um, very much that you would see within a union model. And so DIRA began in 1973 um, amidst a lot of controversy, a lot of suspicion about you know who are these people and how dare they try to usurp um, the the balance that has existed in this neighborhood of basically the churches being in control and the social services. It wasn't just the churches; it was also the social agencies that um, administered to people. Um, so we began a very turbulent uh, couple of decades of Dira, literally fighting tooth and nail at city hall, provincially, federally, even within the neighborhood to assert its presence and its um, vision for, for something that was very simple, Jace, very straightforward. And that was that people in this neighborhood had the same right to good housing, a quality of life, park space, amenities, respect as any other neighborhood, right? It was a very simple premise. And I'm no, I remember that the one of the, the um, objectives of DIRA was equality under the law, right? That, um, and there's a, a very famous mural that Bruce Erickson later painted about the law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets and to steal bread. And that was very much about how Dira saw what was going on around, around it in, in this community. It was literally a struggle to assert rights, to be visible as a neighborhood and as a community and to get recognition from those in power to have um, equal um, and accessible services and housing and, and social amenities. If I could put it very simply, it was basically about power it was about people who had power and authority who did not want to relinquish it. And so a struggle began from those who didn't have power, who didn't have a voice, who were asserting their voice and saying, uh, we have rights and we're going to fight for those rights and we're going to push you out of the way if you don't, if you don't um, willingly relinquish your power, we're going to fight publicly and push you out of the way. And that's, and so many of the struggles that Dira had, they weren't just with the social services and the churches. It was actually with city hall um, 
who were who had neglected the area so badly. I mean, the biggest issue in the neighborhood was poverty and people living in deplorable slum housing. We had to literally fight tooth and nail, bring evidence and force city council to uphold and enforce its own bylaws um, around basic uh, minimum standards of living and fire safety and health safety in the neighborhood. Bruce was a very pivotal figure in the development of the downtown east side because I, I think he had a vision. He had, he had a, an incredible understanding of what the issues were. It was his own lived experience, but also he was a born organizer. I should disclose that he later became my partner and we, we lived together for 24 years until he died in 1997. Um, just before I became a member of parliament. Uh, we lived in the downtown east side. Um, we, we have one son, uh, Leif Erickson, who's now 41. And Bruce was, um, I, I guess he's one of those figures. He was charismatic. He was rough spoken, but he was also an artist. And he had this incredible creative quality about him. People at City Hall couldn't stand him. Um, they saw him as just a, you know, a nasty agitator because he didn't take shit from anybody. Harry Rankin, the city councillor, understood that what Bruce was. And in fact, he used to call Bruce a diamond in the rough. He understood about people's rights. It was, it was part of his life, part of his history, the, the idea that we had to fight. And so he became really the leader and then um, we, we came along Jean Swanson. Jean Swanson, who's now a city councillor, she's in her 70s, but back then she was a young woman, very striking, and she was slinging beer in the Patricia Hotel on East Hastings Street. She was a single parent with two children, and she'd heard about Bruce Erickson because the beer parlor owners had warned her to be careful of him because part of what Bruce did was inspecting the beer parlors informally because they would overserve people deliberately, get them drunk, and then people would go out in the streets and get robbed, not by people in the neighborhood, usually by outsiders. And so he even had a, a death threat put out on his life and the cops had to take Bruce out of town because he had a death threat. And so Jean, was serving him. Bruce used to go to the beer parlors and <clears throat> I was with him one day and I was quite young. I looked very young. And so the boss said to Jean, go ask for her ID. If we can catch him with a minor, this would be brilliant, right? And so Jean got sent over to where Bruce and I were sitting and she asked for my ID, which of course I had. And of course I was of legal drinking age. And she then after that got talking to Bruce on and off. And she said, I want to come and work for you. I hate what I'm doing. I don't want to sling beer. I don't want to work for this beer parlor owner. I want to help Dira. I want to help what you're doing. Some of the issues that Dira had to take on were um, gentrification of the neighborhood. Like in most North American cities, as I mentioned at the beginning, these areas were obliterated. They were redeveloped. That's always been an issue in the downtown east side. And we fought that during Expo 86. It's still an issue today of the loss of this um, low income housing, uh, fighting for social housing, um, trying to get a community center, the battle for the Carnegie Center. Uh, enforcement of, of bylaws. People were dying in fires every year, like just dying in fires. They were like chimney stacks. Uh, the city had a, a fire bylaw that they weren't enforcing. And we, we fought, we had demonstrations, we went to city hall, we had protests. We finally got the, the uh, fire bylaw enforced and nobody died in fires. That's simple. Nobody just enforcing the law. So what did I learn? I learned that when people come together, even if they have been oppressed, even if they have been without a voice, when people do come together and they find that voice, it can become very powerful and people become very resilient. And we still, we see that today in the neighborhood, despite the odds 
of overdose crisis, of the housing crisis, of poverty. They have a right to safety, affordability, to um, community and public amenities, just like anywhere else. These are the things that are the foundation of what the downtown east side should be. Should be. And, and also that there should be economic activity that is generated right by people in the neighborhood. And there are lots of examples of that, but it's never really been sustained enough to help it flourish and grow. I can remember when there were hundreds of small businesses in the downtown east side that were thriving they were wonderful and you could shop and, but many of them have closed down. Um, so that's a whole other question that we haven't talked about, but maybe, you know, your series will get into at some point is, is just the economic um, questions involving the downtown east side and how do we make it a flourishing community um, that doesn't push people out, that welcomes people who live there um, as, as, as their rightful home. Thank you very much for being here today, Libby. 